Howdy. So we've learned that noble gas configurations are extra stable. Uh, noble gases are not very reactive. There are no known compounds with xenon, krypton. I think there's one or two with argon. There are no known compounds with neon or helium. And so they're not very reactive because they have full subshells. And so elements try to get noble gas configuration by gaining, losing, or sharing electrons. This is referred to as the octet rule because all the noble gases except for helium have eight valence electrons. And so two elements, two nonmetals, can share electrons, both getting noble gas configuration, forming a molecular compound. Now I saw for covalent bonds, the more electrons being shared, the stronger the bond, and the closer the atoms are, um, the stronger the bond. Now the most important consideration in bond strength is the number of electrons shared. We also saw that to get noble gas configuration, sometimes elements can lose or gain electrons. And so metals typically react by losing electrons and nonmetals typically react by gaining electrons. And so when a metal plus a nonmetal react, typically they form an ionic compound, the metal loses electron, getting noble gas configuration, and the nonmetal gains electron um, getting no mass noble gas configuration, and so there's a transfer of electrons. Now we saw that the larger the charges, absolute value of the charges, the more stable the, the ionic compound, the larger the last enthalpy, and the higher the melting point. We also saw that the smaller the physical size of the ions, the closer the ions, the more stable, the larger the last enthalpy, and the higher the melting point. Please remember that the absolute value of the charges is the most important consideration in determining stability for the ionic compound. We also learned that as you go up to the right, the electrostatic attraction between the outer electrons and nucleus increases, the size decrease of the atoms decrease, the ionization energy increases, electron affinity increases, electronegativity increases. And so the elements on the lower left have smaller ionization energies, and so it's easier to remove the electrons. The elements on the top right have more positive electron affinity, and so more energy is released when they gain electrons. And so this is consistent with um, our picture of the metals being lower left and the non-metals being top right. And so we've talked about a metal plus a non-metal will have a transfer of electrons to form an ionic compound, and two nonmetals typically share electrons to get noble gas configuration and form covalent bonds. Now, a lot of reality is actually in between these two pictures, and we can determine where on the continuum we are based on the difference in electronegativity. And so the difference, the electronegativity increases as you go up to the right. And remember, the electronegativity is a measure of the ability of an atom to draw electron density to itself in a molecule. And so if the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.5, then the bonding electrons are equally shared. If the difference in electronegativity is greater than two, then electrons are transferred and you form an ionic compound. If the difference in electronegativity is between 0.5 and two, then you have a polar covalent bond, meaning that the bonding electrons are unequally shared, that the more electronegative element gets more of the bonding electron density. And so again, the difference in electronegativity is very important. We can determine where we're at on this continuum. The difference in electronegativity is always defined as being positive. And so in this video, we're going to talk about polar covalent bonds. And again, pure ionic bonds is one end of the continuum. Pure covalent bonds is another end of the continuum. Much of reality is the middle where we have polar covalent bonds. Sometimes polar bonds leads to molecules being polar, which greatly affects its physical properties. Now, after watching this video, you should be able to describe how often bonding electrons are unequally shared. You should be able to describe how the electronegativity of atoms can be used to determine the type of bonds atoms form and which one has the more bonding electron density. And you should be able to determine the type of bond form using electronegativities. And so again, if the difference in electronegativity is between two atoms is less than 0.5, it's going to be nonpolar covalent. If it's greater than two, it's polar. I'm sorry, it's ionic. If it's between 0.5 and two, then it's polar covalent, which just means that the bonding electrons are unequally shared. An atom attempts to attract electrons toward itself when bonding with another atom. The level of attraction of each atom is called its electronegativity. When sodium and chlorine react, the chlorine atom removes sodium's valence electron and becomes a chloride ion. 
The less electronegative sodium atom cannot compete for electrons and becomes a sodium ion. The attraction between the ions is an ionic bond. When bonding atoms have nearly equal electronegativities, neither can attract electrons away from the other. In a carbon-sulfur bond, the electron pair is shared almost equally between the two atoms, resulting in a covalent bond. When hydrogen and oxygen react, the more electronegative oxygen atom cannot completely remove an electron from hydrogen. The shared electrons are attracted more to the oxygen than to the hydrogen atom. This unequal sharing is called a polar covalent bond. Polar bonds have a slightly negative and a slightly positive end. And so they really shouldn't have tried to represent electrons as little dots. Remember, electrons are not just particles. They have wave-like properties. But it's kind of cool. Again, you know, if you look at sodium chloride, table salt, it's ionic. It has electronegativity difference greater than 2. Um, Carbon-sulfur bonds are going to be nonpolar. They have electronegativity difference less than 0.5. And the hydron-oxygen bonds are polar. Their difference electronegativity is between 0.5 and 2. And so please remember, as you go up and to the right, electronegativity increases. Fluorine is the most electronegative. And so we can think about this continuum as we go from left to right. We're going more ionic. You can also think about it as you go from right to left, increasing covalent character. And so the smaller the difference electronegativity of the two atoms bound, the more the covalent character of the bond, then the more the bonding electrons are equally shared. As you go from left to right, your increasingly ionic character, the larger the difference electronegativity of two atoms bound, the more ionic character of the bond, and the more the bonding electron density resides on an atom with a higher electronegativity difference. And so you can actually plot difference electronegativity, I'm um, sorry, you can plot percent ionic character versus difference electronegativity. And so as that difference electronegativity increases, the percent ionic character also increases. And you can also characterize this continuum as, as you go from left to right, the bonds become increasingly polar. And so the larger difference electronegativity of the two, two atoms bound, the more polar the bond, and the more bonding electron resides on the atom with a higher electronegativity. That's kind of cool. We can actually um, do the electron density for a molecule. And so here we have HCl. The surface corresponds to one value of the electron density. And so molecules really aren't, don't look like balls and sticks. They look more glob-like. That's kind of what you're seeing here. And so the surface is one value of electron density. Now, if you remember, again, your periodic trends, chlorine is fairly low on the periodic table. I think it's the third row. And so it's bigger than hydrogen. And so that's why HCl has a pear-shaped um, structure. Now, if we probe the electrostatic potential on the surface of this, and so if there's a negative charge, we color it red. If there's a positive charge, we color it blue. This is kind of what we get. And so red means there's a partial negative charge. Blue means there's a partial positive charge. Now, because chlorine is more electronegative, more the bonding electron density is on the chlorine, and chlorine will have a partial negative charge. Because some of the bonding electron density was grabbed away from the hydrogen, then the hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge. And so this is a fairly accurate represent, re representative representation sorry, of HCl molecule. And so when, it, when one of the atoms has more of the bonding electron density, you refer to this as a polar bond. And so the difference in the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. The electronegativity of chlorine is 3.5. And so the difference is 1.3. And so we had seen that if the difference in electronegativity is between 0.5 and 2, then that leads to a polar covalent bond. And again, all that means is that the more electronegative atom will hold more of the bonding electron density and will typically end up with a partial negative charge. So a question you could see would be, does the sodium and fluorine combine to form molecules or ionic solid? And so fluorine is number nine up here, and sodium is down here. And so we know metal, non-metal, and so we'd think it should be 
ionic. And so it will form an ionic compound. We can also use the difference in electronegativity. And so electronegativity of fluorine is four. It's the number right here below the, the um, symbol. Electronegativity for sodium is 0.93, it's right there. And so that gives us a difference in electronegativity of 3.07, sorry, 3.1. And so that's greater than two, and so we'd say that it was an ionic compound. And so we can use metal versus not metal plus nonmetal gives us an ionic compound. We can just go if, if the difference like negativity is greater than two, it should give us an ionic compound. The uh, difference like negativity is a little bit more accurate way of determining it. Are the hydrogen nitrogen bonds in ammonia polar or nonpolar? And so hydrogen is a nonmetal, nitrogen is a nonmetal, and so we think it should be form a molecule covalent bonds. We have electronegativity of three and electronegativity of 2.2. And so that would give us a difference of 0.8. And so that's greater than 0.5. And so that would be a polar covalent bond. And so if we actually look at what ammonia looks like, it looks kind of like this. The, um, again, the surface is one value of electron density. The red indicates you have a partial negative charge. The blue indicates you have a partial positive charge. Now, you have that big red dome, partly because you have a lone pair on the nitrogen, but also because the nitrogen hydrogen bonds are polar. And so we can determine the bonds are polar based on the difference in electronegativity. Now, are all hydrogen nitrogen bonds polar? And so based on this method, we'd say that all nitrogen hydrogen bonds are polar. And so it doesn't matter if you're talking about ammonia or the ammonium ion. If you see a nitrogen hydrogen bond, it should be polar because you're just using a difference electronegativity between the two atoms involved. Are the hydrogen carbon bonds polar or nonpolar? And so carbon, it's a nonmetal. Hydrogen, nonmetal. And so we know it's going to form a covalent bond. We have a difference, we have electronegativity of 2.6, 2.2, and so that gives us a difference of 0.4. And so the hydrogen carbon bonds should be nonpolar. They're, it's less than, the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.5. And so if we look at the, say, methane, we see that we, we don't see a partial negative or a partial positive because the bonding electrons are fairly equally shared. And so the bonds are completely nonpolar. Now, if the bond of a diatomic is polar, then the diatomic molecule is polar. Now, the reason polar bonds are important is because it often can lead to a molecule being polar. And whether or not a molecule is polar or nonpolar will greatly affect its physical properties. Diatomic molecule, a polar bond must lead to a polar molecule. Consider hydrogen fluoride, shown here as the Lewis structure changes to a ball and stick model enclosed within the space filling shape. Note the polar arrows and the colors. If red indicates high electron density and blue indicates low, you can see that the F end of the molecule is much more negative than the H end, and thus HF is highly polar. Between two electric plates with the field off, the molecules lie every which way. With the field on, however, they become oriented with their negative ends facing the positive plate and their positive ends facing the negative plate. And so while it's true that if you put it in an electric field, they will align, the more important part is that you know, if you have polar molecules, they're gonna have a stronger electrostatic attraction, and that's actually gonna affect the melting point, boiling point, and the vapor pressure. And so for polar molecules, you have a partial charge, partial positive charge on one end, and a partial negative on another end. For diatomics, if the bond is polar, then the molecule's polar, but that's only due to diatomic molecules. And so because of partial charges in polar molecules, they can interact with each other in electric field through the electrostatic interaction. And the larger the electrostatic interaction, the higher the melting point, the higher the boiling point, lower the vapor pressure. Polarity of molecules affects solubility, vapor pressure, melting point, boiling point, a lot of things. I hope that was helpful.